Righto, well welcome along to uh, this GRDC webinar on grain storage protectants. Um, I'd like to thank the Birchall Cropping Group for hosting us today uh, and for putting the, the information out there to get you guys, uh, let you guys know that it's on. Uh, my name is Chris Warwick. Uh, I'm a farm business consultant based in Horsham in Victoria um, and I manage the GRDC's Grain Storage Extension Project. Um, so together with Philip Burrell in the north and Ben White in the west, uh, we deliver information to, um, to, to growers on, on how to successfully um, manage and store grain on farm, um, obviously to, to try and increase profits. Um, as I've said already, uh, if you do have questions, please feel free to type them in as we go. Um, use the Q&A box um, and we'll have, have a bit of time at the end as well if I don't get time to answer your questions along the way, but please feel free to ask your questions. I, I, my priority is to make sure that your questions are, are answered um, along the way. Uh, if you want to ask a question anon anonymously, you can type, um, just select the, the, the send anonymously button and your question will come through. We won't know who it comes from. So there'll be no silly questions, but if you're worried about uh, asking a question, select that send anonymously. Uh, obviously on protectants, we're talking about chemical products. So I need to put a disclaimer out, out there right up front that this is a general guide only, that's not specific advice. Um, and to make sure that you always follow the label directions. Um, and, and for, for protectants that we're talking about today, it's always a really good idea to check with the buyer of your grain before you apply the protectant. So have a think about who your likely buyers might be of that parcel of grain and check that they're happy for you to apply protectants before you use them. Some buyers don't mind protectants, other buyers are selling into a market where they don't accept protectants. So um, it's, it's, it's a really good idea to check before you apply um, to be safe. So as I said, make sure you follow the label directions. What we're talking about here is this general guide only. Um, and, and obviously this is going to be recorded. So, um, you know, there's nothing to stop. The, the label might be changed tomorrow. And what I tell you today is out of date. So always refer to the label as the, the true um, the, the true information that you need to be following. Right, to start us off, protectants, where do they fit into the management system? Um, I like to break storage down into a, a, a three key areas and they are pest prevention, pest control, and then obviously quality management. So uh, if we have a look for, for a start at pest prevention, what can we do to try and avoid having insects for a start? And obviously we've got hygiene and structural treatments, um, aeration cooling, which we're going to talk about in next month's webinar, and protectants, that's what we're talking about today, and monitoring. So all of those things fit into the category of pest prevention. They're not designed to kill insects, to deal with an infestation, they're designed to prevent them. If we want a pest control, we've then got to go to phosphine or a commercial fumigator or controlled atmosphere. And obviously grain quality is about managing moisture and temperature. So that that clarifies for us what we're trying to do with protectants. So what do we need to know about protectants? Well, uh, as I indicated there, they're, they're, they're designed to deter insects. So we can't afford to wait until we've got insects in grain and then try and spray on a protectant to, to control them. They're not designed to do that. Um, if you want to think of it, I know it's not quite an exact um, analogy, but if you want to think of it as a bit like AeroGuard rather than a fly spray. So you put AeroGuard on to try and prevent the insects, prevent the mosquito bites, that sort of thing. Um, you don't spray AeroGuard on an insect trying to kill it. Um, so if you think of protectants a bit the same way in that we're trying to prevent the insects, we're really not trying to, to, to kill a live infestation. Where they're really suited to is the non-gas type sealable storage. So to use phosphine successfully to be able to kill insects, if we do get an infestation, we need gas type sealable storage. So if that's something we don't have, maybe an older silo, um, maybe sheds or bunkers, um, uh, even underground storage, if it's not gas type sealable, then phosphine's really not an option for us. So that puts extra reliance on all the things that we can do to try and prevent insects. And that's where I think protectants really come into their own. So uh, th they're another tool in the toolbox to try and um, prevent us having an issue. Typical protect protection um, is, is in the three to nine months. 
depending on the product, they'll have different um, different sort of sort of loss brands. Um, and some of them you can apply at different rates. So you can put a three to six month rate or a six to nine month rate. So be aware of what rate you're applying and what sort of um, length of protection you can expect out of these products. But typically in the three to nine month range. The other thing that will affect how long protectants will last and be effective is temperature and exposure to UV, to sunlight. So the cooler the grain temperature, the better the life of the protectant. So if we can cool it down, um, we, we increase the life of the protectant. Obviously by cooling the grain, we're also slowing down the insect breeding life cycle. So we've got a double effect there if we can cool the grain down. Um, and exposure to sun, these products will break down um, under sunlight. So obviously store them out of the sunlight, that's an obvious one. Um, but also if you've got a bunker or a shed or something like that, um, if you've got a shed that's open at the end and the sunlight coming in, expect that will break down these protectants reasonably quickly. So even if you can cover the end of the shed with a door or a tarp or something to stop the sunlight, it'll help these protectants last a bit longer. The other thing that we really know is that even coverage of the protectant on the grain is really crucial to success. So we can't use the old drip method anymore. We've got to actually spray the product uh, onto a flow of grain in an auger. So getting nice, good, even coverage um, will, will help us out. We've got to remember that these chemistries, the chemical products, they're not magic. We've got to do everything we can to give them the best chance to work. So combining our protectants with our hygiene structural treatments, with our aeration cooling, and with our good monitoring, um, even then having the, the grain cooled, um, you know, putting a good application on, um, as in good quality application, even application, um, gives our, our chemistry the best chance of working. If you think about, um, we do a lot of spraying out in the paddock with the fungicides and herbicides, we try and get the application good. We get the water rate right, we get the right conditions, um, we get good even coverage with our nozzle spacing, a, a droplet size. Think about the protecting application the same way. The better we do the application, the better we can expect the chemistry to work for us. Okay, so how do we select a product? There's, there's a few out in the market there. Um, how do we go about selecting them? This is a little guide um, based on what we know uh, where the resistance status is for the, the, the various uh, insects. So often we hear about people talking about they got weevils in grain and, and that everything's a weevil, but in actual fact there's five common ones um, that we see in Australia uh, and the socket is, is not so common but is out there. Um, so what we need is a product or a mixture of products that we can expect to protect against all of the insects. No good if we go to the effort to putting a protectant on. Um, in, in, in the case of KO Bile or Conserve Plus, not very effective protection against the rice weevil. If we don't identify the pest properly and understand that the rice weevil is something we commonly get at our place, um, well then we actually we might miss out and, and actually not get protection against the we the one insect that we really need. So for that. For that purpose, both the KO Bile and the Conserve Plus, you can see they've got good protection there against um, the, the five, the four of the five main ones, the lesser grain borer, the rust red flower beetle, the sawtooth grain beetle, and the flat grain beetle. But neither of them are that great on the, the rice weevil. So what we can do, and the label will, will direct you to do this, is to add with either of those two products, either Reldan or Phenitrothine. So by mixing the two together, you can see there that Reldan and, and Phenitrothine, they're both effective on the, we the rice weevil. So mix the two together and you actually get uh, quite good protection on, on the five key, key pests there. So the, the two products that, that give you the, the, to summarise, the two products that will give you the, the best um, protection on, on, on the insects is Kaobiol or Conserve Plus. But add with it either a Reldan or a Phenitrothine. And again, follow the label directions. Okay, little decision tree to help us out here. Which one should we pick, Conserve Plus or Carbile? Um, what we recommend, and, and both companies, um, Bayer that distribute Carbile and Corteva that distribute Conserve Plus, 
both of those companies actually recognise that it, in an ideal world we rotate the chemistry. So switch between the Conserve Plus and the KOBIL every one or two years to rotate those chemical groups, same as you rotate the chemical groups in the paddock, um, to, to make those chemistries last for many more years to come. If we stick with one chemistry and for, for some reason we won't have something quite right, well, that chemistry is going to break down. But if we rotate them, we'll, we'll help them last much longer. So rotate from one to the one to the other every every year or so. Um, if we're wanting to store malt, barley, rice or maize, on, on the left hand side here, we're then going to look at well, how long do we expect to store the grain for? Is it sort of three months or we're looking more three to nine months? Um, if it's three months, we use phenytrethine at the low rate as our mixing partner. If it's three to nine months, a longer period, we use phenytrethine at a higher rate. Now, labels will tell you which rates to use. What we need to be aware of is that at the low rate of phenytrethine, we've got one day withholding period. At the high rate, there is a 90 day withholding period. So that's something to really be aware of. 90 days is quite a long time. So if it's long term storage, that's great. But if we're not sure how long we're going to store it for, be aware that phenytrethine at the higher rate does have a 90 day withholding period. If we're not storing malt, barley, rice or maize, we can switch across to the right hand side and use Reldan as our mixing partner. So again, you've got a three month storage there, you can put the Reldan at the low rate, but the, nine, the three to nine month storage there, you want the Reldan at the higher rate. So they're your main decisions. Is it malt, barley, rice or maize? If the answer is yes, phenytrethine is our mixing partner. If it's no, if it's wheat, barley, oats, trip or sorghum, then we can use, we can use either phenytrethine or Reldan uh, as our mixing partner. Again, providing that the market we're selling to accepts all of these protectant products. Um, the Reldan doesn't have a withholding period. Um, a lot of the products, however, they do say don't move the grain for 24 hours after application. So while there might not be withholding, if you follow the label, it says don't, don't move the parcel of grain for 24 hours. So that's something to be aware of. I hope that little decision tree helps guide you towards the, the type of decisions that you need to make to select the right protectant for your application. And again, this is a guide. Um, the labels might change tomorrow, so make sure you always refer back to the label um, to, to ensure what you're planning to do is, is actually on label. The cautions, um, I feel like there's a lot of cautions with protectants, um, but, but for good reason. So check the marker requirements before they're using it. It was actually only last week we were notified that Thailand um, no longer have an MRL, so they no longer accept Reldan as a protectant. So that's just one example um, of as of December they won't accept Reldan. So always check with the market you think you might be selling into. Um, give your buyer a call and, and check whether they like protectants or not. A lot of them don't mind at all. Um, some of them will say no, the markets we're selling into um, don't like protectants, so we're not going to buy grain with, with protectants on them. So always check with the market. This one's an obvious one, but it's um, one that's really important is only one application is permitted per parcel of grain. So if we expect we're going to store grain for longer than nine months, we can't go back and put another application on. We've got to make sure there's only one application. And that's why a lot of these products are only limited to on-farm use. The bulk handlers can't use them so that they can't risk applying another lot of protectant on a grain that's already had it applied. Something else to be aware of is that some of these protectants, even at the label rate, are right on the MRL, that maximum residue limit. What that means is that even when we apply them perfectly at the label rate, they're really close to what the markets will pick up as their MRL. So we can't afford to do the, you know, the dodgy things and say I'll put a bit more on or I'll, I'll you know, won't worry too much about my application. Um, because you'll, you'll find yourself in breach of an MRL very quickly uh, and that'll become very costly. So we can't afford to, to muck around with this stuff. Um, it, it's got a good purpose, but we've got to respect it. A few 
few more things that we need to know. To buy KO Bile, we actually have to do a little online training course. They do run face-to-face -face courses from time to time. Bayer organise those, um, but it's not it's not onerous. It's really about trying to make sure that the people applying the product understand what it's trying to do, understand how to apply it and and do it properly um, to get the best results. So a short little online training course. Um, Conserve Plus requires you to register your um, NGR, National Grail Reg uh, Registration Number, um, to be able to buy the product, again to help with some traceability and make sure you understand what it is that you're, you're buying and how to apply it. Most of you will know that protectants are not registered for on-farm use in Western Australia, um, but I'll put that in case anyone doesn't know that. The other thing I'll suggest is both of those, those two main products, the KOBile and the Conserve Plus, um, KOBile distributed through Bayer, Conserve Plus through you know, Corteva. Both of those websites actually got some really good resources on there uh, for more information on, on protectants. In particular, the Bayer website's got some great little videos on how to apply the products. Um, some really good de demonstration videos there. If you want more information, I encourage you to go and have a look. They're, they're a good resource. I, I think they're, um, they're really practical and well done. Okay, what else to know? I think I've said enough times that you can't, can't forget, follow, always follow the label directions. Water quality is something to, to consider, um, particularly if we're using bore water. We want a pH fairly neutral between five and nine. Um, if you're worried about that or you want to be sure, just use tank water. Um, it's not like we've got thousands and thousands of litres going on with protectants. It's one litre per tonne of grain. So, um, you know, surely we're not using that much water to do it. If you've got tank water available, it is really worth doing. Uh, along those same lines, the labels recommend that we only mix enough product for that day. We don't keep the product overnight. And we want to make sure we keep it agitated during use so that that chemistry doesn't fall out of, um, out of dilution with the water. Um, so that's really important. Um, Obviously, we want the grain to be clean and free of insects before the application. As I've said, no, no point trying to apply it once it's already got insects in it. Not going to work. Um, occasionally, you might hear of people saying they applied a protectant and they did get a kill. Uh, look, that's the exception, and we don't know whether those insects may have even died of old age. But it, it, they're not designed to kill live insects is, is the, the message there. So you've, you've got to have grain that's clean and, and free of insects. And as I said already, don't move the grain for 24 hours after that application. Calibration uh, and application. You, you may have seen or even used yourself um, the old drum dripping a bit of protectant in the, the auger hopper. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't really give us very good coverage. So what we're looking for, even coverage, again, to give this chemistry the best chance, is one, ideally even two spray nozzles. So we've got a, a little tank to do our mixing with agitation um, and we've got a pressure pump that we can actually calibrate and two spray nozzles mounted in the auger. So we want to mount those a good distance apart, one to two metres apart, um, mounted in the auger there um, and, and that'll give us good mixing as the grain comes past, it'll get a good application um, and, and continue up the auger and get good mixing to get nice even coverage. Um, what we know is that'll give it much better coverage than, than putting it in at the hopper here. Um, belts or, or tube veyers, um, shifters, they really don't give the best coverage um, applying a protectant through, through a belt or a shifter. Um, the auger does give us a much better mixing and, and coverage of the product, so that's something to be aware of. It's also um, some of the manufacturers don't like putting um, protectants on the belts um, because you end up with, with product around all the bearings and rollers and all those sort of spots and you might end up with belts slipping. So in the auger is the best bet there. Obviously we want to do our calibration with fresh water um, before, we, before we go mixing the product in. So the, the, the general gist is that we, we would have a bit of an idea of, of our flow rate of our auger. So if we know that it takes us um, you know, a certain amount of time to unload a truckload um, with our auger going into our own silos, our own storage, we can calculate back, is that auger doing one tonne a minute, two tonne a minute, 
um, what sort of flow rates our org are doing, therefore what sort of flow rate our application system has to do. Is it got to be one litre a minute or two litres a minute to match the flow rate of the, the grain? So we do that calibration with fresh water before we start our, um, our application. As well as being safer, of course, we, we don't want to co-wasting these products. Some of the labels I find a bit confusing um, is to actually how, how much product do we apply? Um, to give you an example, one product says um, one litre of product per 50 litres of water. Another one will say one litre per 100 litres of water, which can be a bit confusing when we consider that we want one litre of diluted mixture, chemical and water, per tonne of grain. I don't know why they don't just put it a bit simpler, but um, my method for uh, for calculating this is to divide, in, in the case of product one, one litre per 50 litres of water, divide our one litre of product by our 50 litres of water, times it by a thousand to get it to millilitres, and we know that then there's 20 mil per tonne of grain or per litre of mixture. I hope that makes sense. The product two is an example, one litre per 100 litres of water there. So one litre divided by 100 litres of water times a thousand to convert the litres to mils. So we know we need 10 mil per tonne. We can then multiply those numbers out by how many tonne we want to treat for the day um, and, and, and figure out how much product we need to mix up. Um, in the case of product A, um, another example there, they've got 500 mil per 50 litre of water. So we do a 500 mil divided by 50 litres. It's already in mil, so I don't have to do times it by a thousand. Um, we've got 10 mil per tonne or per litre in the application. And the last product there is already in mils, and it's already per litre, which is really nice and easy there, six mil per tonne. So that's the way I'd encourage you to do the calculation, even get the agronomist to check it, get someone else to check your calculation because it's, um, it can be a little bit confusing on how much we actually have to apply um, from those labels. Work out how much per tonne. It's always a litre of mix, um, chemical and water per tonne, but how much chemical to actually put in is the, is the key there. And again, we can't afford to get this wrong. We can't afford to stuff it up um, because these products are very close to the maximum residue limits. Personal protective equipment. Probably goes without saying, but it's a good reminder in any case. Um, most of these labels um, call for um, covered skin to the wrist and neck, um, so overalls or, or long sleeves, um, PVC gloves, of course, um, some sort of eye protection, goggles or a face shield, um, and a respirator. Some of them ask for a respirator if you're applying it in a confined space, like a shed or something, um, and a washable hat. Uh, is the general things, but again, the label will tell you what PPE you need um, to, to safely apply these products. Key points, just as we're, we're finishing off to summarise, protectants, really good preventative option for non-gas tight sealable storage. So um, you can make the choice if you've got sealable storage, still do all the other prevention options, um, do the hygiene, the structural treatments, cooling, aeration, cooling, monitoring, you can decide whether protectants are needed or not given you've got the option to fumigate with phosphine if you need to. But for your unsealable storage, given you can't fumigate, you might want to put a, consider a protectant um, to give yourself every chance of not having an issue. Check market requirements before applying. Um, it's a good idea to know your common pests that you have on farm. So actually getting the back pocket guide and having a look at what it is that you commonly get on farm to know what protectant you might want to choose the following year. Um, it, it's, it's, they're not all weevils, we all call them weevils, but there's five of the key main ones and they all are a bit different um, and the chemistry works differently on them. Uh, I think I've said enough times that the, the application really is quite important with these products. Well, that brings us to the end of um, the presentation side of things, but I'm sure you guys have got some questions. So please feel free to now type in the, the Q&A box. Um, let me know your questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Whether it's on protectants or something else grain storage related, happy to take the opportunity to, um, to, to have a, 
um, have a look at your questions and, and see if I can answer them. While you're doing that, um, the next webinar will be on the 10th of December. That'll be on aeration cooling. So I encourage you to come along to that one um, or dial into that one. Um, and of course, if you're looking for more information on grain storage, I've got it there on your screen. 1800 Weevil is the phone number that will put you in touch with your, um, your closest grain storage specialist or that website, storedgrain.com.au. Um, it's also got uh, some great resources on there. I'm not seeing any typed in here, so I'm assuming that everyone's either uh, had their questions answered or they're still uh, deep in thought. But as I said, feel free to call that number, 1-800-WEEVIL, um, or shoot us an email, info at storedgrain.com.au, um, or use that website, storedgrain.com.au. Uh, if you do think of a question down the track, um, the levies paid through the GRDC fund us to do this work, so don't feel as though you're going to get a bill um, if you do contact us for, for information. That's part of what you're paid for. Um, so feel free to, to use that service. If there's no, no further questions or comments or thoughts, um, thank you again for coming along. Keep an eye out for the, for the next one on the 10th of December, and I look forward to catching up with you again then. Thanks very much. <laughs>